All right, all right, all right. Welcome to the Dennis Colazzo Show. As always, leading off, my first guest is the Honorable Luke Jones, doing great things in our community and also in the sports world. Luke, welcome in. Dennis, how are you, my friend? Happy bye week. You know, a chance yeah. to exhale a little bit. Raven sitting at nine and three and sit back this weekend and watch the rest of the NFL play out. Uh, certainly a, a great time if you're a Baltimore Ravens fan uh, with the way that I would say the first half of the season, but being such a, a late buy, you know, almost three quarters of the way through the season. So uh, certainly uh, lots to be excited about if you're a Ravens fan, that's for sure. Absolutely. You know, I haven't even looked at the schedule this week. I'm pulling it up as we're talking now because uh, I, I guess we should talk about the Sunday night game. Catch everybody up uh, in the scrub against the Chargers. Uh, nip and tuck game. Uh, there were moments there that caused us a lot of concern, right? But the uh, the bottom line is they, they won. Uh, they, we've seen many teams lose. We've seen the Ravens lose in the fourth quarter. It's just the way the league is designed. I don't think it's anybody's fault. Um, between the uh, injuries and the, the referee calls and non-calls, I still can't believe that people bet on these things, uh, Luke. <laughs> how can, I mean, how can I, you? I know, right? How can, I mean, how can you? Well, uh, hey, there – and. There are people listening right now that would tell you that either themselves or they know someone who does very, very well with it. But I'm <laughs> I'm with you. I, I always joke that I know enough about it to stay away from that realm. But, hey, all you see now is you know, sports gambling and sports betting and ev every other commercial. And the uh. league is certainly uh, you know, not just the NFL, all the major sports, I mean, have leaned into it completely. But uh, it is crazy. And I, I think as we go back and look at Ravens chargers on Sunday night. For me, it was really a case of the Ravens for stretches of that game. And basically every other phase uh, of the game tried to out charger the chargers, mm. but I keep coming back to how incredibly well the defense played on Sunday night. And let's face it. That's been the theme throughout the year. I mean, not that the offense hasn't been good. And at times the offense has been great, but it has been in, less consistent the defense i mean let's we could go through game by game if you wanted to dennis when has the defense really faltered over the course of the season okay second half of the browns game in baltimore no doubt about that they gave up too much rushing yardage they made deshaun watson look like steve mcnair okay marlon humphrey got beat in pittsburgh by you know pickens of, on one play after the offense had just squandered so many opportunities eventually yeah the defense is going to get beat you know, the indie game, they gave up a little bit too, more, too much yard yardage on the ground. But even that game, they got a safety late in that game that felt like that should have finished it off, but they didn't. So the point is, we can point out these very isolated incidents. Fourth quarter of the Cardinals game, which was still a little more garbage time than real threat uh, to me. But hey, they did have to recover an onside kick at, at the end of that game. But the point is, you can name on one hand and still maybe even have a finger or two left over the number of times that the defense has really faltered over the course of the entire season for even a quarter, you know? So whereas the offense, it's been more up and down, right? It's been some games where they didn't perform very well over the course of 60 minutes or they perform really well and then bogged down in the second half, uh, whatever it might be. So the, the calling card for this team has been its defense. I think certainly – I, I think some of the talk comparing it to the 2000 Ravens defense a few weeks back that, that cooled off a little bit after what happened against the Browns. And that was always you know, a little bit much, but I do think this is a defense that has the chance to be the best Ravens defense we've seen since maybe 2006, which go back and look at the numbers for that group. That was a really special group uh, that you know, very much was Super Bowl caliber had the offense been able to do anything against Indianapolis in that divisional round that uh, in that postseason. So, you know, the point is, this is the best Ravens defense we've seen since the days of Ray Lewis and Ed Reed. And I feel very confident uh, in saying I think that's going to continue. That's not to say that they're going to have to carry them to a championship. I don't know if you can really ride a defense to a championship in the way that the 2000 Ravens were able to, to do that. But I, th I certainly think this is a defense that is – far more consistent, far more potent, far more dangerous, far more confusing to opposing offenses than we've seen in quite some time here in Baltimore. Yeah, Luke, and you and I talked about the, uh, this game. Uh, uh, we, we analyzed it, broke it down a bit. Um, Justin Herbert, to me, I, I got Drew Bledsoe vibes watching him. You know, big guy, big arm, but... And, of course, Brandon Staley, I thought he was even worse at this, this pressure than 
<laughs> one, just gave a lot of credit to the Ravens. Uh, uh, average 500 records as a coach, uh, definitely on the hot seat. But uh, but back to the, the Ravens defense, that one play where Patrick Queen and, and Roquan Smith just smashed the Austin Eckler, I guess it was supposed to be a screen, but those guys got there in the blink of an eye. But you're right. Then this is and Brandon Staley said it himself. He said this was a defense playing at a very high level without Marlon Humphrey. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, that's what's been so impressive uh, about this defense that if someone had told you this group would have the success, it would where they would be right now, which is going into the month of December, a nine and three. I mean, right there. And and look, some people will continue to talk about the Cleveland Browns defense, and the Browns defense is really good too. And and I still think there's something to be said. When you're a defense like the Browns and your offense has such issues, I mean, you know, we, we talk about the Ravens offense, but it's, you know, it's, it's just inconsistency, you know, at times. It's not, it's still a really good offense. Whereas the Browns offense, I mean, it's lost for, for most of the, they can run the ball pretty well and that's about it, right? So especially now with Watson being out of the picture. So I think there is something to be said for a defense having the resolve that you can keep that up when you know your offense isn't giving you much help. But regardless, you look at this defense and you've seen how good it's been. You would have been stunned back in late July to to know that the Ravens would be at this point, but Marlon Humphrey would have missed a majority of the games to this point in the season. David Ajabo would be would have been an absolute non-factor and is out for the year, as, as we learned this week, uh, with a partially torn ACL that was repaired. Uh, that... Tyus Bowser would not have played a snap to this point. Uh, you know, you you go through, Marcus Williams would have missed the amount of time that he missed. I mean, just go through and it, it while it's been great and it, there's nothing fluky about it, let, let me be clear in, in me saying that, but what I just laid out, I'm guessing people wouldn't have been talking about the, thinking the Ravens would be the best defense in the NFL and leading the league and certainly leading the league in sacks, you know, you know, with, with that and, and, and knowing that Ajabo was a total non-factor and Owe missed what four or five games, you know, four games and mm-hmm. parts of a fifth. Uh, so it, it really is impressive what, across the board, what they've been able to do with their defense. And it really, I, I, I had this conversation with Nestor earlier in the week and he kind of, talked about Roquan Smith and don't get me wrong I still think Roquan Smith is a force multiplier but I think the success of this defense runs so much deeper so much greater than just Roquan Smith I think what has made this defense so impressive to me is the ensemble identity that it has I I mean perfect example and I noted this in my 12 Ravens thoughts at baltimorepositive.com take a look at what Arthur Millette did in that game He had the interception on the Hail Mary, and I get it's a Hail Mary. I mean, it's not this massive high leverage play there. He could have easily knocked the ball down, but he got an interception, uh, had a tackle, you know, which is a a good stop on a play. And then obviously he had the pressure and the quarterback hit uh, on the fourth down late in the game. Arthur Millette, I just said, made three impactful plays there. Dennis, he played seven snaps in the entire game. So that right there speaks to just how collaborative this defensive effort is. And let's be clear. There are Pro Bowl talents on this team. I mentioned Roquan Smith. Jadavion Clowney's having a Pro Bowl, maybe the one of the best seasons of his career. He was going to be my next question to you about Jadavion Clowney. Break him down for us. Yeah, we'll get to him because some interesting things uh, about him during the bye week. You know that we heard from Chuck Smith, uh, their outside linebackers. And I was going to hear your thoughts about Chuck Smith as well. There there you go. No no doubt. Two two questions. No doubt. But you know, you have Roquan Smith. You have Jadavion Clowney, which we'll see if Clowney makes the Pro Bowl or not, but he certainly is in that conversation, right? And, 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 you know, edge rushers and sack totals and all that. But he's been great. He's been great. Kyle Hamilton. Yes. uh, Kyle Hamilton's the guy, Dennis, that I would say at this point in time, and this kind of lends itself to what you mentioned about Marlon Humphrey. This is no disrespect to Marlon Humphrey or anyone else on that defense. Justin Matabike, who is that double digit sacks. I'm not so sure Kyle Hamilton isn't the second best player on this defense at this point behind Roquan Smith because of how much he does, how versatile he is, what he does at the line of scrimmage, his ability in pass coverage, uh, you know, ability to rush the passer when he's asked to blitz. So, so, so they have some tremendous talents. Now, you know, don't get me wrong, but it really is such a collective effort on this defense. And, And maybe another great example of that was the example of Patrick Queen on the blitz where it looked like he had a free shot at Justin Herbert, 
but he played his assignment, which was to basically set up a teammate there. Now, there is a situation where sometimes it's like, okay, you do have to open your eyes and take what's there, even if it's not exactly uh, how the play is drawn up. But that right there shows the unselfishness of this defense. And, and I think anyone would tell you, well, look, these guys want to make, you know, they want to have numbers. You know, they, they want sacks. They want tackles. They want interceptions because it's a business at the end of the day. And when they have to go, their agent has to go to Eric DaCosta or any of the 31 other sure. decision makers around the NFL for money, for contracts. Yeah, those numbers matter. But within the context of what this team is trying to accomplish this year, boy, you just have such buy-in. So it is really a testament to everyone, you know, the front office and the scouts and uh, Eric DaCosta for bringing in uh, the right players, drafting the right players, signing the right guys. The coaching staff, uh, beginning with Mike McDonald, and, and as we mentioned, other guys, Anthony Weaver and Chuck Smith, and we'll get to the pass rush in a moment, uh, as we alluded to. Uh, but it, it's also just the players buying in, right? Uh, I, mean, I mean, again, there's there's so much that goes into being successful at the NFL, but, but guys want to be, you know, it's a business. It's their livelihood. It's their chance to make life changing money that's going to set up not just themselves for the rest of their careers, rest of their lives, but their kids or maybe their grandkids, depending on how successful they are. So, so there is inherently, there's going to be some selfishness at some point. Uh, th there has to be, you know, in, in the same way that anyone uh, that you know, you, you're making, you know, you, no one just works for the fun of it, right? I mean, it's your livelihood. Uh, you, you have fun doing it, but it's your livelihood. So, for them to have the buy-in that they get and for them that just, you see guys that step up on a week by week basis. And again, Arthur Millette was just such a great example of that this week. You look at the two or three splash plays he made, played seven snaps, you know? So it really does speak to how collaborative the, the, the this defense really is, how complimentary it is. Uh, and like I said, you know, it's, it, it's this great ensemble cast that, you know, at any given week, you're having guys that, you know, sometimes you don't even call their name and other, you know, look at Broderick Washington was a healthy scratch a week ago and had a sack late in this game. Not that it was the most critical uh, play of the game, but, you know, the, the point still stands. So it, it really just is, is so impressive for this defense to do what it's done. And like I said, it's got it's got its elite talents, but boy, it, it's just it, it's such an impressive collective effort. Uh, and really the pass rush leading the league in sacks. And I get it. Matabike and Clowney are up there, but to lead the league in sacks. There's no T.J. Watt on this defense. There's no Miles Garrett on this defense. I mean, no one is quite that dynamic. Matabike is as close as it comes, but even him, you know, he's an inside pass rusher. You know, you don't view those guys in quite the same light, even if we should maybe, but just so impressive, the the, the true team effort they're getting with that defense. And it, it's really taken their defense from uh, a defense that was really good at the end of last year to what's been a great defense here in 2023. Now, all great points, Luke. Uh, Jadavian Clowney, and, and I'm glad you brought him up. Uh, he's been great against the run, great at rushing the passer. And I, I want to give some some credit to Coach Harbaugh because they do have a culture. The Ravens have a culture of letting the guys be themselves, right, within certain parameters. So with, with Clowney on the team and Mike McDonald's uh, influence and, and also uh, Chuck Smith, right, Talk. let's talk about that and – and I also want to caution our listeners that, you know, I, I like Mike McDonald. He's done some great things. But anytime you get a promotion, you're moving away from your strength. It, and it doesn't always translate. He may be a great head coach. He may not. But we do know that that John Harbaugh is a great coach, right? So um, I know Harbaugh's got knocked, and <laughs> rightfully so, for some of those challenges or non-challenges or whatever. But um I think I think guys like Harbaugh. They want to play for him. They play hard for him. And I think part of maybe what what what's happened with Clowney's uh, resurgence here, right, rebirth on the Ravens. You got to give credit to the coach. I mean, you give credit to everyone, but yeah, I mean, it it begins with John Harbaugh at the top there. And I mean, look, and what you just said with Mike McDonald. I mean, it's so fascinating. And obviously, it's by week, so you hear so much of in course. terms of okay. He's, Mike Mike McDonald going to get hired somewhere else. I've heard people talk, and and you know, I there's some merit to the idea of if you know if you're Steve Bashotti and you kind of look at John Harbaugh and say, okay, I mean, John, how much longer do you want to do this? You know, is there something we can work out that this is like Eric DaCosta eventually replacing Ozzie Newsom? I'll hear all that, but again, there's an unknown. In the moment, in the right. present, 
everything fits so well. And I mean, Jadavion Clowney is such a great example of this. I mean, this is a guy who, let's be clear, and Chuck Smith made this point, other than Lamar Jackson, there's probably no one on the current roster who's been scrutinized uh, as much as Jadavion Clowney. And Lamar, of course, yeah. more because you're talking about a franchise quarterback and his contract situation, how high profile all that was. Uh, but in the case of Clowney, you're talking about someone who was regarded as this epic talent coming out of college, coming out of South Carolina, number one overall pick. And his career did not play out like a number one overall pick, right? He's no. had a good career. And I think anyone, I mean, let's be clear, was never a bust. Let, let's he's he Jadavion Clowney wasn't a bust. A, a bust is someone who's out of the league in two years. And, and you say, Oh my gosh, that was an absolute disaster. That guy was a, a embarrassing to our organization, whatever it might be. And we've seen plenty of those, uh, particularly at the quarterback position, but it'd be tough to look at Jadavion Clowney compared to what he was coming out of college and seeing what his career has been and say, it hasn't been underwhelming. And, and a lot of that had to do with guy had microfracture surgery on his knee. Uh, yeah. What his first or second year, whatever it was. I mean, that is a kind of surgery that oftentimes oftentimes will end someone's career. I mean, that's, you know, that is a tough surgery. So anyway, back to, to where Clowney was at this stage of his career, he was considered someone who was physical, always had the violent hands, good against the run, solid pass rusher, but not someone who's put up big numbers, certainly hasn't been a dynamic pass rusher. Uh, you know, it never had a double digit sack kind of you know, never put up 15, 16 sacks, you know, first team all pro kind of season in the way that when the Texans drafted him, they thought that's what you're going to get every year from Jadavion Clowney. Yep. You know, we can all remember the highlights of him in college. So, so you have all that. You have a guy who's been with the Browns uh, the last couple of years, ugly departure at, at the end of the season last year in Cleveland. And look, I mean, how much of that was him? How much of that was the organization? I'm guessing it's a combination of both. You know, I, I don't think you completely absolve the player, but we also know the history of the Cleveland Browns as an organization. So you now you kind of take it for what it is. And then, you know, the Ravens talk with them at one point, you know, they had some discussions and then they eventually sign him midway through August. And he comes in, he talks about having wanted, wanted to play for John Harbaugh. And when you hear that at the time, you take it with a grain of salt because any team that has a coach with any level of accomplishment, any level of tenure, they're probably going to, make some mention of having wanted to play for the coach because they're trying to endear themselves to the media, trying to endear themselves to the fan base. But you look at the perfect storm. Clowney comes in, Anthony Weaver's the defensive line coach, coached him in Houston as a, as an assistant there. So has a familiarity with him. Chuck Smith, the Ravens outside linebackers coach has worked with Jadavion Clowney because Chuck Smith was a private pass rushing coach for years, had worked with Clowney uh, at very, you know, earlier much earlier in his career so so right off the bat there's some institutional knowledge on what makes Jadavion Clowney tick what makes him good as a player all of that but so so you have that factor but I think what was also fascinating and Chuck Smith uh, laid this out is Jadavion Clowney's grown as a player this year and he mentioned specifically and I'm not I'm not going to get too technical here because one I'm not a pass rushing savant uh, or anything like that but I know that Jadavion Clowney had tried to learn the, the cross chop uh, pass rushing move for a long time. And uh, Chuck Smith even said that he would watch him at, at different stops in his career and, and, and even reach out to him at times and say, that's not quite it. You know, that's not quite <laughs> it. He has mastered that this year. In fact, he used that very move on the strip sack, uh, obviously after, you know, to end the chargers insanely long drive, it, you know, that went from the end of the third into the fourth quarter and they don't get any points. You know, that came on the cross chop. So I think th the biggest lesson for me here, and we've talked about this a lot, you know, through the lens of the Orioles with their rebuild, but this is Jadavion Clowney having a growth mindset. And, you know, someone who's been in the league a long time, yet is still striving to get better and em embraced being coached. And he's got a go-to move now. And, and Chuck Smith is big on that. Obviously, he's a pass rushing guy. He's been big on everyone on that defensive front having some kind of a pass rush move. Now, you know, does everyone have a legendary move in the way that you think of like Dwight Freeney with the spin, the way that <laughs> he was like that guy that gave Jonathan Ogden more trouble than anyone, you know, talking about J.O. being a Hall of Fame left tackle. So, so I, I just think it's really impressive and it just speaks to 
you know, Clowney, it's a, re a reflection of just what I mentioned, the buy-in for this defense, and they all play for each other. And uh, I think it also is interesting, you know, with Chuck Smith and Anthony Weaver. And Chuck Smith was very – that both those guys talked to the media on, I guess it was Tuesday, and they both made clear that, hey, this isn't just about me. This is also his – you know, he deserves credit too. What the Ravens have done this year, they've kind of streamlined uh, – it in past years, they would kind of have the defensive line – and the outside linebackers separate. And, you know, I mean, and obviously they have their full team or full defense meetings and things of that nature. But this year they've really had those two groups work together and be in the meetings together that it's really streamlined what they're doing. So, you know, it, it gives you a much more multiple seamless pass rush where, yeah, I mean, there are times where Clowney lines up at the three technique. They've had Adafi Owe line up over the nose at times. You know, you'll have Brent Urban or Broderick Washington or Matabike line up at, at five yeah. technique on occasion, although Matabike typically stays inside. So the point is, it's just there, there's so much that's gone into this. But when you have a, a Jadavion Clowney, a guy who, if anyone would have, you know, at this point in time, have not an excuse, but he's 30 years old. He's his 10th year in the league. If anyone's going to have a an attitude of, I've kind of learned everything I'm going to learn at this point. It would be him, and you know he's had a, he's still had a rock solid career, but for him to kind of have this renaissance that he's had, and to hear Chuck Smith explain it, and to hear how the cro cross chop and you know, just search on Twitter, Clowny cross chop, and you'll see some defensive line guru types that you always find on Twitter, you know, on social media sharing how that technique, that pass rushing technique has been a game changer for him because for him, he was more of a, just a, a power, throw his body around, violent hands, physical kind of guy. And that, and that worked for him, but it wasn't leading to him putting up monster sack numbers. Whereas you look at him now, he's got seven and a half sacks. He's got a great chance to, to be a double digit sack guy. Although I will point out Justin Houston was at a similar point in the season last year and wore down. So I think that's you know, a reminder that some someone like Clowney, you want to continue to manage his snaps and, and keep him fresh the rest of the way. But it, it's just, you know, it, it really speaks to how much buy-in there is. And again, going back to your point about John Harbaugh and the culture and you know, Chuck Smith even laughed. He said, my wife hears so much about team culture and she just rolls her eyes. But, and look, it is eyewash for in many places. And, you know, it's not, you know, every team has a certain amount of culture, right? And you still have to go out. You still have to have talent. You still have to have guys go out and make plays. You still have to have a, a certain amount of good fortune. You still have to stay relatively healthy. So it's not everything. But I do think what we've seen with this defense, uh, you know, with guys like Clowney and Kyle Van Noy coming in, you know, in, in Clowney's case, right toward the end of training camp, in Van Noy's case, after the season had already started, and see the success that they're having, uh, as two veteran players who, like I said, if, if there was anyone who had the attitude of, I've learned everything there is to know, I'm kind of who I am at this point in my career, it would be those guys. And yet they've bought in and they've learned things and they've even grown as players. I mean, I mean, what a great example that is for someone like Adafi Owe sure. who is in year three. And, you know, let's face it, first couple of years wasn't off to a great start with his career. And we've seen him take a step forward. So it really is just so impressive the the entire defensive operation and you know it for me it's the biggest reason why they're nine and three and it's not that's not a knock on Lamar Jackson or the offense and we know Lamar is in the MVP conversation but the defense has been so consistent week after week after week save for a couple quarters here and there that you know it, it's just it's really been impressive and uh, it's a you know, huge reason why this team's a legitimate Super Bowl contender this year. Well, Clowney's having fun, clearly. The whole team is, particularly the defense, right? They're having a lot of fun. They're touching the quarterback. They're getting the reps. And uh, I know that Clowney expressed frustration. He said uh, when he was with the Browns, they were more concerned about getting Miles Garrett better matchups, matching him up against the weaker offensive lineman, which, look, it's a really good strategy. But I think another big key is why these edge rushers are having some success just about it, about a PK, right? Uh, uh, Broderick Washington, uh, Travis Jones, Michael Pierce, they're getting that push up the middle. And when the quarterback can't step up, he's got to escape. And when you try to escape, you got these ends uh, crashing down on them. And because of their rotation, they're fresh, right? And, and Clowney's a dude. We watched him 
give the Ravens a hard time when he was with the Browns. We watched him give the Ravens a hard time when he was with the Titans. There was one game, I think he just spent half the game in the, in the backfield. So they are having fun, and they're playing at a high level. It's, and it's good that Chuck Smith has been a great influence on these edge rushers as well. No question. I mean, Chuck Smith has been an influence on the edge rushers. He's worked with the interior guys and same thing with Anthony Weaver. Anthony Weaver is the defensive line coach, but he's worked with the edge rushers. Uh, Weaver brought up a really interesting point this week. And, and you and I've talked about this, you know, we've talked about this for years and Tom Brady being a great example of this, of when you could get inside pressure on him, um, you know, yep. the, the ball would come out so quick. So even if you had great edge rushers, they wouldn't always get to him. And there are things that you can do to account for edge rushers. You know, you can keep a block, uh, a, Blocking tight end in, you can chip with the tight end. Obviously, you have you have a back, you know, in, in the case of the Ravens, you know, you use someone like a Patrick Ricard. Mm -hmm. But Weaver made the point, and, th and this really pertains to Justin Matabike, but it also applies to any of their other guys when they're lining up on the inside. He just said, you know, there are things you can do to account for a guy on the edge. There's only so much you can do when a defensive tackle lines up. You know, yep. you can try to double and, you know, I mean, there's some of that, but you're much more limited. I mean, obviously you want to be aware of where that guy is and you want your quarterback to be aware. Uh, that way your quarterback has, you know, is ready to have an answer to, to you know, a hot read, whatever it is, hot route, you know, to, to get the ball out quickly. But when you have that pressure that's coming right in your face, uh, where, the, you know, a, a defender is coming at your legs, whatever it might be. I mean, it's that is a different animal than, someone coming off the edge where, you know, you can step up in the pocket. You might, you know, you might be able to shake loose. It's just, it's tough when it's inside there and it's, you know, it's, it's right in your face like that. So I think what Matt Abike has given them, it's just, it's a different dynamic. And I think you and I talked about this even a couple of weeks ago where, you know, you kind of think back over the history of the Ravens, even with all their defensive excellence, you know, who have been the great interior pass rushers for them. I mean, Haloti Nada at times, but no, I mean, Nada was never a guy who put no. up big sack numbers. Um, you know, I, I think you go back to 2006, Trevor Price put up monster numbers that year, but he was still more inside outside at that point. You know, he wasn't lining up exclusively as a defensive tackle in the way that Matt Abike almost always is lining up, you know, as, as, you know, kind of a three technique. So it really makes such a difference. And again, there are things schematically you can do to account for guys that are rush, rushing off the edge, but there it's, you're much more limited in what you can do uh, against defensive tackles. I mean, again, you can try to double, but uh, again, uh, you try to do that, your numbers, and it's going to set someone else up, uh, especially someone coming from the outside then. So I, I just think that's been such a, a, a different element that the Ravens typically haven't had. I mean, they've had good pass rushes in the past, uh, but, what's made this much more dynamic and much more difficult, not just the scheme. And we've talked at, at length about the scheme and sim pressures and guys blitzing from the nickel, like Arthur Millette or Kyle Hamilton, you know, I, I mean, you know, it can, it, it can, you know, pressure can arrive from just about anywhere, you know, uh, with that front, and especially when you're having seven or eight guys at the line of scrimmage. And even if they're rushing four, you don't know which four are coming. Uh, but, I still think Matt Abike's presence just, you know, it's made such a difference for them uh, in having someone who, you know, even with all the games and, and, you know, pressures and blitzes and exotic packages that they run, you have someone in Matt Abike who can just win inside. And they just haven't had many guys like that over the years. And there aren't many guys like that around the NFL. You know, that's why no. Aaron Donald has been this alien for a decade, right? So it really just speaks to, you know, the, uh, another unique factor that's that the Ravens have going with this pass rush and this defense. Yeah, Sam Adams was twitchy for a big man back in the 2000 defense, but still, yeah. he was much bigger than 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 Meta B. Right, Meta right. B. He looks like a bodybuilder. Uh, but I did take a look at Sport Track, uh, and I, they projected numbers for next year. Meta BK, he's 26 years old. They had him at 355, right? Three years for 55 million, and they had Patrick Queen at around four for 66 or so. 24 year old player, so very young still uh, for Patrick Queen. So they'll have some they'll have some uh, cap space headaches next year as Lamar Jackson's uh, salary accelerates, right? Yeah, and maybe that you know that leads us into something that I wrote about it at BaltimorePositive.com. Yeah, look, let's shift to the other side of the football. Yep, Ronnie Stanley. Uh, uh, I mean, we've and we've talked about it, Dennis. Yep. I do think that right knee has been a problem for him. 
Uh, to his credit, he tried to get, you know, he came back after one, just one game off. And, and you know, because at times, look, fair, unfair, perception, reality, whatever. It's missed a heck of a lot of games the last few years. So, of course, there's frustration from the fan base, uh, you know, and, and and some of that at times is unfair. You know, I, I, I certainly think he wants to play. I certainly feel for him as a competitor. But, yeah, th- this is an example. Maybe it wasn't the wisest decision for him to try to play and certainly Khalil Mack ate his lunch and to be fair Khalil Mack has done that to a lot of great left tackles I mean you're talking about a guy who's at least going to be uh, in the conversation as a Hall of Fame player if not a Hall yes. of Fame player outright so but let's call a spade a spade I mean this has probably been the worst season of Ronnie Stanley's career I mean just using pro football focus and I get it that is not the end all be all evaluative tool and their grades are not gospel but it's been rough. And I think the reality is going back to, you know, what transitioned us to this conversation is the Ravens are going to have a heck of a lot of tough decisions with with free agents and just roster building moving forward because the reality of Lamar Jackson's contract, it's just there. It's not a knock on Lamar. It's just any franchise or any team that has a franchise quarterback that is elite and, and making elite money, you have to adjust from a roster building standpoint. And I'll say this much, you absolutely must get proper production and value from your highest paid players on your roster. And where they stand right now with Ronnie Stanley, considering Lamar's cap number is going to go up next year and considering this boatload of free agents that they're going to have, I think Ronnie Stanley might be playing for his Ravens career the rest of the way. And now let me be clear. It's not as simple as just saying, oh, we're going to cut him because even in a post June 1st scenario, you're going to be taking on some money. You're going to take on a heck of a lot of money pre June 1st. So the best case scenario within the realm of realistic understanding, he's going to be 30. And I'm guessing the ship has probably sailed on him becoming the guy getting back to the guy that he was in 2019, for example. And also understanding that the injuries probably aren't going to improve when you get to the wrong side of 30. If you're someone who's subject to a lot of injuries, but the best case scenario is probably Stanley getting that knee in a better place over this buy. So, you know, and that's why I asked John Harbaugh this question and John flat out said, look, it hasn't been great. Ronnie would probably be the first to tell you it hasn't been great. He's got to get that knee right from a technique standpoint, from a bend standpoint, being able to anchor all of that. So it's not as though anyone's just saying Stanley's just bad now. And that's just who he is, but he's dealt with the knee. He's got the ankle that's cost him basically two full seasons going back to 2020. So they need to see a better version of Ronnie Stanley. And, and you know, that per, on a couple levels, one, if they truly want to maximize their Super Bowl potential, that's not to say that they, that they can't win a Super Bowl with Ronnie Stanley, not playing his best, but it's like the Mark Andrews thing, right? Mark, a, a better Ronnie Stanley makes things easier for you in the same way that if you had Mark Andrews, things would be easier for you. Uh, and, and knowing that, He's not going to be back until best case scenario late in the play in the playoff run uh, if they get that far. So they need a better Rod, Ronnie Stanley to maximize where they want to try to get this year. And you need that. You'd like to see that from a decision making standpoint, because the best case scenario is probably him playing at least one more year. Even if you're looking going into next year's draft and saying, you know what, let's try to find our franchise left tackle of the future. Maybe we'll play it like the Ravens did way back in 1996. And Jonathan Ogden was drafted. And where did he play his rookie year, Dennis? Left guard. Yep. That could solve a problem at left guard for one year. You have Stanley for one more year, can mentor the young guy. And then, you know, you see where you are at that point. But if they don't get a better version of Ronnie Stanley than what we've seen so far in 2023, I think you need to, I think you need to bump up that, 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 the urgency of that succession plan. So, you know, I, I think, you know, again, going back to, you know, where I kind of took this conversation, you have all these different guys that let's face it, they're not going to be able to keep everyone. I mean, they're just not, Uh, I mean, I think they're, you know, they're going to try like heck to keep Justin Matabike. But if you do that, there's no way you're keeping Patrick queen. You know, you're, there's no way you're keeping Geno stone around who, you know, deserves to start somewhere. You know, I mean, that's just where it is. And Marcus Williams, to his credit, has played really well, you know, uh, since that first game back where there was the concern about his tackling. So 
you know, you're not going to be able to keep everyone, but you do want to try to keep some of these guys. And if you're looking at Ronnie Stanley, he's just, he's not a $20 million. He's not playing anywhere close to a $20 million left tackle. I mean, I still think to be clear, because I've seen some conversation about this, he's still their best left tackle. Patrick McCary has been better at right tackle when he's filled in than left tackle this year, though McCary played very well back in week two, to his credit, but Stanley's still their best left tackle. He still has their best, the most upside. But Dennis, the fact that we even have to say that is a major problem with where they are from a value standpoint with Ronnie Stanley. So, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny. You know, a lot of, you know, the, the Ravens are going to be watching him closely. You know, John Harbaugh didn't hide from it. I mean, you know, they, they know he's, Ronnie knows he's not playing very well, yeah. you know, so it, it's nothing personal. And, and I'm empathetic for all the injuries that he's gone through. I mean, that ankle injury, that stunk that that happened. And there's no way the Ravens could have foreseen that. Certainly it's not something that Stanley wanted to have happen two days after he signed that extension. But here we are three years later and there's a significant value problem with Ronnie Stanley. So, you know, if he plays better the rest of the way, I think you still probably plan to have him on the team next year. Maybe you can try to rework the deal a little bit, make it a little, little more cap friendly to, to help you sign some other players. But but if it's much much of the same the rest of the way, I, I don't know if the Ravens are going to have much of a choice but to to, to kind of pivot and, and see if, about bringing someone else in. Uh, you know, and look, not saying that you're going to find someone that was as good as Ronnie Stanley four years ago, but I, I don't think you, especially when that's the guy protecting your $260 million quarterback's blind side, you're going to need – you're going to need better than that over the course of the next couple of years. And, you know, I, I don't know if Ronnie Stanley at this point, I don't know if, if he's up to that, especially at, at the compensation level that he currently finds himself. And, you know, it's just, you know, there, there's a value problem there. And, you know, when, when it's been as problematic as it's been, Hey, they're still nine and three. Let me be clear. Th these are sure. still relative problems, but I, I think you still got to look at it in terms of where they're going roster building wise. That, to me, if you're unless he's better down the stretch, that's going to be very problematic going into the offseason with all these free agents. Yeah, there's Andrew Voorhees uh, hanging around again. Uh, hopefully he's healthy in 2024. Deep draft for offensive tackles, uh, deep draft for cornerbacks, two areas of need for the Ravens. So hopefully he'll straighten it out. But for this year, his injury, when he goes down, certainly uh, shifts the balance of the offensive line. Mark Andrews goes down, shifts the balance of the entire team. And we saw that, uh, I guess, the, the the performance against the Chargers was to be expected uh, by the Ravens' offense, given that you're missing such a huge piece of your offense in Mark Andrews, right? Lamar Jackson's safety blanket, his, his, blanket, his go-to guy in third down, his go-to guy in the red zone. So Lamar has to has to go on living without Mark Andrews uh, for the rest of the, perhaps for the rest of the season. Yeah, I mean, you certainly you can't play the rest of the season expecting Mark Andrews to come back. I think sure. from a mindset standpoint, if you're Lamar Jackson, if you're Todd Munkin, you have to be planning as though Andrews isn't going to come back because it's still that's not considered a high percentage. There's a chance that he could come back maybe by the AFC championship based on, you know, some of the conjecture that's been out there. But uh, he had surgery. He's on IR. Uh, you know, he's not going to certainly not going to be playing the rest of the regular season. So they've got to figure it out. And I. I think what was a little discouraging is, you know, it, it, again, relative. They won, right? I mean, they, they were able to get the running game going when they needed to. They, you know, they made enough plays, but they did have the extra rest coming off of the Thursday night game. So they had, you know, and, and hypothetically, Todd Munkin had a few extra days to prepare. Sure. And let's also face it. I mean, this is this was not a good Chargers defense. I mean, this is a lousy Chargers defense on paper. And I give them credit. And look, they still have Derwin James. They still have Khalil Mack. So I don't want to completely say they're devoid of talent but we saw what Jordan Love did the week before uh, against them for example so so from that standpoint it was a little discouraging see them seeing them not be able to have more success in the air and look they did some early early on they did I, I thought Munkin and Lamar did some you know some nice things in terms of for example getting the ball to Isaiah Likely in space I don't think this was a for me what I'm talking about here isn't Andrews being out and Isaiah likely was a disappointment. It's the entire operation. We talked about this is going to have to be a collective effort uh, of four or five different guys stepping up. And Lamar Jackson happened to 
step up his trust level in some other guys. Uh, that's just where they are. You know, you, you can't, you know, this isn't as simplistic as Isaiah likely steps in for Mark Andrews and everything is peachy dory, you know, like it's hunky dory, you know, it's, you know, they've, they've got to uh, adapt. So from that standpoint, you know, you kind of look at what, how it played out four of 13 on third down, you know, they were one of two inside the red zone. Uh, you know, they were unsuccessful a couple of times on fourth down and we could certainly, you know, the direct snap to Gus Edwards, you know, that, that to me was a little too cute, but at the same time, you go back and look at it, it looked like it was there if it was kind of run correctly. Uh, but, you know, the point is th- they do have some work to do on that front. And I think that's, for me, one of the biggest questions I have for this team uh, f- for the post buy stretch, you know, beyond talking about, you know, Stanley, as I mentioned, beyond talking about, like, you know, the running back position, Keaton Mitchell, you know, do we see him start to become more, bigger? You know, what happens with you know, the, the defense in, in terms of do they, you know, do they break the franchise sack record? Do they, you know, what's it look like with Marlon Humphrey coming back? Like, you know, some questions like that. I really do look at the passing game and they do need to find a little bit higher level of consistency, higher level of efficiency. You know, I, I think you kind of look at, and I don't mean Lamar, I mean more the offense in general, but you kind of look at since that Detroit game where they were just amazing you know as incredible as incredible could be offensively in that game you know it's been a little more up and down arizona not so good offensively seattle game really good you know that that reminded you of you of detroit cleveland game up and down cincinnati you know it was good this week not not so great so it's been a little choppier on that front and look when you have a defense as great as the ravens defense Okay, you know, and they look, they've they've won what, you know, six of their last seven. So it's not as though they're not in great shape. But if you're looking through the lens of January and understanding how tough the rest of the regular season schedule is going to be, let alone getting into January where you're playing a good team every single week or a great team every single week, they do need more consistency with that passing game. And you know, the first you know, they, they did a great job adapting against Cincinnati when Andrews went down, obviously, early in that game. But, you know, their, their first full game lesson, you know, or, or first full game test, I, I should say, uh, without Mark Andrews, you know, it's a little choppier. And, you know, that's prob- to your point, probably should have been expected. Although I would have liked to have seen a little more against, you know, again, not a very good Chargers defense. But it certainly uh, shouldn't, there shouldn't be any complacency, at least as it pertains to that going into the bye week so that's where todd munkin and t martin and keith williams and george godsey you know all the offensive assistants going into bye weeks and all right how are we how is this passing game going to evolve because obviously without mark andrews it's different you know again it's not as simple as plug and play likely for andrews and everything's fine so you know there's going to be some evolution that's going to have to be at work here but uh you know the, the running game's been good to excellent passing game has been really good at times but it hasn't been as consistent and if there's you know the biggest area for me for this team between now and getting into the playoffs is you know you've got to find a higher level of consistency and it doesn't that doesn't mean Lamar throwing for 400 yards every week but when they are throwing the ball you do want to see uh some improved efficiency and you know you've got to find you know, who that, how, how you're going to replace that Mark Andrews production. Again, likely is part of that. But for me, maybe it's Zay Flowers becoming a little more of a sophisticated part of, you know, of this offense from a route running standpoint, maybe a little less underneath for him and maybe pushing the ball downhill, downfield with him a little bit more. I, I, you know, it's going to have to come somewhere, you know, Bateman, Odell Beckham, you know, it's going to be a collaborative effort, but you know, that really is, for me, the biggest question for this team as as we come out of the bye week. And again, you know, it's not against a specific opponent, just wanting to be more consistent week to week on that front, because, Hey, you know, you're at some point in time, this defense is probably going to have an off game. You know, (laughs) we've been saying that, you know, it probably will happen at some point. Uh, So if that's the case, you want your offense to be ready in the same way that the defense was ready to step up when the offense had its issues against the chargers on Sunday night. Of course, and uh, as the Ravens have a bye this weekend, we'll see the the Cardinals and Kyler Murray as uh, they're hosted by the Steelers, right? And then 
The Browns travel to the Rams. Perhaps Joe Flacco starts that game and the Bengals at the Jaguars. So we'll be rooting for all the uh, the teams against our divisional opponents. Luke, with that, please tell our listeners where they can find the social media, all the great stuff you do for Baltimore Positive, WNST, your blog, and everything else that you do. Absolutely. I encourage everyone to follow us on Twitter, at WNST. You can follow me personally, at Baltimore Luke. Check out my blog at BaltimorePositive.com, sponsored by Coons for the Baltimore. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, a, a piece on Ronnie Stanley. I'll have more on Jadavion Clowney and – uh, some of the Ravens outside linebackers. Check out my 12 Ravens thoughts. And I'll even have a piece over the weekend. Questions for the stretch run. I mean, this is a Ravens team that is nine and three. It's currently number one in the AFC, although probably at, at by the end of the weekend, probably won't be but because of tiebreakers. And assuming that the other three lost teams uh, don't all fall this weekend. Uh, but Ravens are in a, in a great spot. But yeah, they do have some questions the rest of the way and some fun questions such as Lamar Jackson's MVP candidacy. Uh, I'll be pondering all that at BaltimorePositive.com. You want to be on the WNST Baltimore Positive Tech Service sponsored by Coons Ford of Baltimore. Uh, if you are, you get the final injury report of the week. Game day inactive sent directly to your mobile device 90 minutes prior to kickoff. Any significant local sports news sent out via the WNST Baltimore Positive Tech Service sponsored by Coons Ford of Baltimore. And of course, anything throughout the week on AM 1570 with Nestor. Ravens players and coaches interviews, including interviews with some of the Ravens assistants, Chris Hewitt, the secondary coach, talking about Kyle Hamilton and Brandon Stevens. And uh, we mentioned Chuck Smith, Anthony Weaver, uh, T. Martin talking about Lamar Jackson's development uh, as he uh, is putting up, you know, another very strong season at quarterback for the Baltimore Ravens. Check out all of that at BaltimorePositive.com. All right, my friend, always insightful, always informative, always hard hitting. I appreciate you, Luke. You have fun this weekend watching uh, the uh, other games, and uh, we'll reconvene the same time next week. Yeah, I encourage everyone to have a, a nice, fun, stress-free football weekend. Hey, because uh, it, it only the, the, the intensity and the, the anxiety only grows from here as the Ravens come out of the bye week, and it's a bear of a final five weeks. There's no doubt about that. Even the Rams looking a little bit better the last couple of weeks. So uh, certainly not a game to, to sleep on there with Matthew Stafford, but plenty of excitement. So rest up because uh, these next couple months could be very fun, but also very nervous uh, yeah. as we get closer and closer to January. Yep. We'll be Cardinals, Rams and uh, Jaguars fans uh, for about three hours this Sunday. Luke, I appreciate you. And with that, we'll take our next break here on 1570 AM WNST. We'll be back right after this.